My name is Professor Tanya Kravinska. Um, I'm a professor in screen, uh, screen arts at Brunel University. I'm also the president of the Digital Games Research Association. And I'm here um, because um, I've written a paper particularly about horror game rhetorics um, with specific interest in an adaptation of an H.P. Lovecraft couple of stories uh, called Call of Cthulhu Dark Corners of the Earth. You have to handle suspense and narrative rather differently in a game environment than you would with a movie. Um, cinema, cinema tells stories through, through chopping into, into the film and, and by making it but through, through different camera angles. Um, and in a game, you don't have the opportunity to do that. So you can't tell a story through editing. You have to tell stories in, in slightly different ways. The other thing is, is that um, as a spectator, you don't really do anything to affect what's going on on the screen. Uh, obviously, in a game, you have a lot of scope and potential for going different places, uh, doing different things. So the more free your player is in a game context, the less easy it is to deliver a story in the same way that we're used to in relation to a, cin in, in relation to a film. Uh, so suspense, for example, has to be dealt with differently. Um, you have to start thinking about how you're going to deliver shocks. Um, uh, you're also going to have to think about how you're telling your player where to go in the game so that they can then kind of get, get shock tactics or, or they're not just kind of bum bumbling around doing nothing. Um, so my real interest in, is in video game aesthetics and I'm interested in how one uses the form to deliver particular emotional um, content for players. Well, uh, especially in a 3D environment, you have, you have to think, think, think things through quite carefully. And I think there's, you know, that you can look at how other people have done it to, to kind of open up your own creative process. Um, I think in particular Silent Hill is a very good case study to look at and the way that they used fog to prevent you from seeing what's around you. Uh, so the player can't actually see where potential threats come from. And that's indicated just simply through uh, a ra radio static, that, they, that, they, that the player knows something is coming, but they can't possibly see where it's com coming from. And they, but they know they have to act. So, you know, in the cinema, you pretend you have to act. You're acting like you might act, even though you don't have to act. But the panic induced in a game when you know something is expected of you is something that you can play on very much. So expectations, learning how to use expectations creatively in a game environment is something, is something that's a good lesson to be learned. Uh, my, my kind of model here is, is that um, a game is a series of patterns. So the player learns those patterns and you your, the learning curve that the player takes is, le is understanding the vocabulary or the elements of a particular game. And you can also play with those. So generally speaking, when they go round a corner, they might expect a monster to be sat there. What you might do to break their stride is to not have it there for a few goes, so that then they're still aware that there might be one, but they haven't had one recently. So what you have to start thinking is the about is the experiential pa pattern of, of the player, and then throwing in the odd, um, um, overturning an expectation. In, this, in a way, cinema has already done this, but. Um, but in the context of a game, set up some patterns and then disrupt them. And that's one kind of very fundamental way that you, that you can put them off stride and put them on edge. I think games have been haunted, haunted by cinema all the way through its history. It's always the, the, the kind of the holy grail is to get a cinematic experience. And that means having photorealistic graphics for a lot of people. Uh, there is the sort of the quest for uh, verisimilitude. Um, and there also might be verisimilitude in terms of, of what one is able to do in a game environment. But this is where the aesthetics come in. It's actually a game world where you can do literally anything uh, stops being a game and, and it becomes a, a sandbox, a, a, a place to play in and not a game. So I think the, the trick is to understand best 
and to be exploring how to orchestrate the player's experience within the game. Uh, and, and I don't think for a moment that photorealistic graphics are the key to a good gameplay experience. In fact, they can be detrimental to it. They can stand in for it. And we've seen so many games where the graphics are lauded, because, uh, but actually the gameplay isn't that great. It's gameplay that, that com it comes down to. And atmospheric gameplay doesn't rely on good graphics. We've seen this in Silent Hill. Uh, it, the sort of textures that you can get through digital technology means that you can do things that you can't really do uh, in, with a camera, in a, essentially. And I think it's very interesting when you look at movies like the Silent Hill movie, which, which work really well, but it's working with the textures that were developed for the game. So I think we could see cinema as being informed by video games now, and horror cinema being informed by video games. Uh, uh, you know, it's the other way around. Um, but, but for me, texture, movement, those kinds of things, the thing, subtle suggestions of things might be what we're looking for if we're looking to create a very uncanny, spooky experience for a player as opposed to just a gore shoot 'em up first, uh, which I'm not particularly interested in.